Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our morning worship service. We're glad to welcome you today in the name of the Lord. It's my privilege to welcome you to this worship service. Folks are still coming in today and we're just thankful for everyone. And looks like we've got a pretty good representation of our church family today. Those of you who are watching over the uh, airwaves today, we're thankful for your coming <clears throat> coming to church with us. Even though you may not be sitting in a pew, you may be in your easy chair at home, but we, uh, we enjoy your presence nonetheless. So today we're looking forward to hearing from Pastor Charles the morning message, and uh, I'm sure the Lord has blessed him with a good message for today. And we're going to have the children participating. I don't know where they are. I think they must be getting ready right now to come in. So I'll mention just a couple of things for you today that uh, you can see in your bulletin. And <clears throat> uh, we just want to mention the um, bridal shower for Heather coming up real soon. We want to mention the seniors pizza luncheon that's coming up real soon. And uh, the family worship night, Sunday the 23rd of August. So you, all of these are in your bulletin. If you need more information, you can call Terry at the office. And uh, one final important announcement, Joshua Scruggs is gonna be with us, candidating for our youth pastor position, our youth position. So Joshua will be here on the 16th and uh, he'll be preaching that morning. If you're at home and you're uh, not able to come, we, we want you to be sure to listen to him preaching on that Sunday morning and also the Q&A, the question and answering session afterward. And then you can vote uh, by coming to the office or calling the office and uh, uh, on the... Um, 19 from the 17th to the 19th so be sure to watch him as he's preaching and the question and answer service afterward we've met with joshua uh, at least twice and so we're thankful for his for his coming but most of all for the lord's leading in this because the committee has voted unanimously to uh, recommend him to the church so we're looking forward to having him with us. I think that's about everything. Pastor Charles, are the kids ready to come in? Bring them on in. Isn't it great to have the kids back in church with us? Let's give them a little bit of a hand. And we can... Lillian.
Great job, kids. Would you stand with us this morning as we start our worship time together singing to our Lord?
sings, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face.
Good morning. It's great to see all of you this morning. I'm going to read from Deuteronomy 31. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day, a gift from you, and the opportunity to gather in your house at Elkview Baptist Church. Father, we are thankful for the presence of your Holy Spirit and rejoice in knowing that you will remember this day and all who have assembled to worship and praise you and hear your word. Father, open our hearts to that word that Pastor Charles will bring to us this morning about Jesus. Father, kindle a fire in us to be more like Jesus. It is our desire to serve like him. And it is our desire to forgive like him. And Father, it is our desire most of all to love like him. Forgive us when our own self-interest and pride come before the need of others. Humble us before you and others that we may do your will in all things. Fill us this morning with your enabling spirit. Father, there are many in this church this morning, in our church body that are facing difficulties in their lives, their health concerns, the loss or impending loss of loved ones, and collectively a concern for the future of our nation. Father, we thank you that you are with us and will never fail or forsake us. This morning we continue to lift up Edsel and Joyce Prunty. We are thankful that Edsel's pain is better controlled and we ask for healing in his treatments, Lord. Lord, this morning we pray for Mike Farrell's uncle as he faces death. His uncle was special to him, Father. And we ask for comfort and that you bring peace to this family. Father, we also pray for Joshua Scrubs, Scruggs, our youth pastor candidate. Open our hearts and minds to Joshua's Kennedy for this position as we receive him soon within our midst. And Father, we ask for continued guidance and strength for our church leaders and the ministries of this church that we may always serve others and bring honor and glory to you. You are Almighty God, a God who moves mountains and parts seas, a God who can heal broken hearts and heal a divided nation, a God who has overcome all things in this world, a God whose love for his children is beyond measure. Father, we know and are thankful that you always keep your promises, and there is nothing in this world that can separate us from your love for us. All these things we ask in accordance with your will and in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning. Boy, it's great to see you here. This is a very good attendance and and yet we are uh, all safely spread out and, uh, and we are about as safe as we can be. There is no risk-free life, is it? But it sure is good to see you. Thank you for your diligence and your efforts to come. And, and those watching online, we're just so thankful for your faithfulness week after week. And right now, at this very time, um, just grateful. We have two children's churches that are underway at this moment. We have a teen class underway at this moment. And we're just grateful for all those ministry leaders that are uh, moving forward. 
And I can't say enough, uh, aren't you thankful and grateful that for all these months, we have had a music program accompanying the, the, uh, the preaching of the word. Aren't you glad for that? I sure am. I'll tell you. <clears throat> that worship corporately it just blesses my heart, and I know it, um, it kind of sets the tone for my, for my worship. Then also our ushers. My goodness, since we resumed services, you know, months ago, um, our ushers have been a critical part of things working smoothly and just so grateful for them. Well, I invite you to open your Bibles back to John chapter 1 as we continue one more week on the Jesus series. And we began an introduction of Jesus last week from John 1. And I think chapter 1 verse 11, if you let your eyes fall on that in the Bible, I think this is one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture. Jesus came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Now that's got to be one of the saddest verses. That Jesus came to uh, the Jewish folks, he lived among them, he walked among them, he ministered among them. And yet they did not receive him as a whole. They did not receive him for who he is. God in the flesh. Would we recognize him today? Do we recognize Jesus properly for all that he is? Last week, we said the word of Jesus. He is the word, the word of God in John 1. Do we recognize Jesus for all that he is? The word of Jesus will settle every issue we face. And then the light, last week we said the light of Jesus conquers every dark corner in the world, but in our lives, in our hearts. He conquers darkness. And then the authority of Jesus mentioned in verse number 12. It says, that he gives us the authority, the right to become children of God. Jesus is the authority that secures our adoption into the family of God. Do we receive Jesus today for all that he truly is? I want to continue that with three simple points. Jesus is the glory of the Father. Let's read about that beginning in verse 14 from God's eternal word. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of Jesus and cried out, saying, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me. Because Jesus was before me. And of his fullness we have all received. And grace piled upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Well, Jesus is the glory of the Father. It mentions this several times. The glory of God is revealed in the person, the God man, Jesus Christ. You know, before Jesus became, before Jesus came, people simply had an incomplete view of God. Think with me for a moment. God's law in the Old Testament reveals something of, of God. It reveals that he is certainly separate from humanity. It reveals that he is holy. It reveals humanity is not holy. God's law reveals certain aspects about God. Think about the wonderful creation of all the world and all the galaxies. It reveals something about God. Creation it does. Oh, whether we're looking through a telescope or a microscope, we can see the wisdom of Almighty God in creation. 
We can see powerful forces working that are unbelievable, such as the sun and that great ball of fire that energizes so much of growth and life on our planet, and yet it's a million miles away. We can see so much power displayed from God through creation, but that's just a partial view. Think about the Old Testament sacrificial system and the understanding that we got about the omnipotent God in the sacrificial system. We would understand that we as finite, fragile, created beings cannot flippantly approach holy God, that we need a covering, we need a sacrifice, because he is so perfect and we need covering for our sin. The sacrificial system gives us some insight. Think with me that we have partial view of God throughout all of humanity for thousands of years, a partial view of God before Jesus came. Think about Mount Sinai. What took place at Mount Sinai? The Bible tells us that fire descended on that mountain. Smoke was billowing up. The Bible says that the earth was quaking and even rocks on the mountain were being split and rock slides were happening. And Israel as a nation was camped at the foot of that mountain and they got a partial view of God again. His great omnipotence, his power. But this is a fractional view. And then we see in Isaiah, that great prophet in the Old Testament in chapter 6, he had a vision of the throne of God. And in that throne room, the, the one on the throne wore a robe. And that robe swirled about and it filled and crowded out the entire temple. And we could understand that as the cherubims flew around that, that throne of God, they were crying out, holy, holy, holy. And we certainly get an, an understanding of the incredible majesty of our maker and his holiness. But yet we do not have the, we just have a fractional view of God. Then a hundred years later, we come to a man in the Old Testament named Ezekiel. And he had a vision that God gave him to help him understand better. And he had wheels that were set at different angles. And a platform rested on those wheels and on top of the platform was a, a visage, a theophany of a throne. And God and an image of God was there. A visage of a person on the throne. But the thing about these wheels is that they would move with fluidity and ease in any direction. And instantaneously transport this throne just instantly to a whole other scene in the vision. And there we got another partial understanding of the omnipotent creator's ability to be omnipresent. He is everywhere at the same time. He does not have space and time limitations such as you and I. He's there. He's here, by the way. But folks, before Jesus came, we had a partial view. As great as all these descriptions of our almighty creator God is, you can't get uh, a better description than verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus, our view of God becomes complete. The word becoming flesh will now be our perfect teacher. You know, think about all those truths I just spoke about. The truth of God's holiness, the truth of man's sinfulness, the truth of God's majesty that we can't relate to. It's intimidating. God is so separate. He's so powerful. Think of all those truths. And I would say to you that truth alone is cold and harsh. But when you put all those truths, encapsulate them into a human body with flesh and blood, and his name is Jesus, now you have grace and truth have perfectly kissed each other. And we have one that has dwelt among us 
and we have the most complete view of God that will ever be given to humanity in Jesus Christ. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. You know, God's grace is seen in Jesus Christ. Just the fact that he wanted to relate to us the crown of his creation, human beings. He wanted to relate to us, so he stepped into a human body. That is an act of grace. So that we would understand who God is. We did not deserve his favor, his kindness. That's the very meaning of grace. And yet it says again and again in verse 17, grace and truth have come together. You know, we have received already. If you're today a child of Jesus Christ, you have transferred uh, your, you've depended upon him simply to be your savior. You've been born into the family of God. Then friends, you've already received of his fullness John makes reference to the fullness of Jesus Christ. And this means the abundance of his grace. Verse 16 says, grace for grace. This means uh, favor after favor. I'll tell you what, blessings in sequence is something that we, uh, we can use right now, right? Grace piled upon grace, but my friend, we are receiving grace piled upon grace through Christ Jesus. The grace is endless. The favor of God is endless. And he piles favor upon favor. We're so undeserving of it. But the Christian life can rejoice in this, that once we've come to Jesus set for our Savior, a faithful supply of various graces God gives for every circumstance in life. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. No matter what we're going to face, we get grace piled upon grace. And we get that through Jesus Christ. Now, we're talking about a partial view of God's glory and that we need to take a fresh look at Jesus Christ in the series, the Jesus series. And we need to see that he is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form, graciously given to us so we can pattern our lives after him. Are we ready to receive Jesus the way he deserves to be received as the Lord and master of our life, the creator God in human flesh whom we would follow all the days of our life? Are we ready to receive him? Think about the partial view that primitive humanity had of their understanding of lightning and thunder. You know, think of how that view has emerged to more factual things now. You know, I am told that the early Greeks believed that lightning was a weapon of Zeus and that any spot that was struck by lightning became sacred. And the ancient Greeks would worship at spots that had been struck by lightning. And then, hundreds of years later, in ancient Rome, the College of Argus, they had a habit of searching the southern skies for lightning. And in the southern sky, when a lightning bolt traveled from east to west, that was a good omen and it meant the presiding emperor and the presiding parliament should proceed. But if that lightning bolt went from west to east, something was wrong. And historical documents actually record that this College of Argus, their reports were followed and political passage of laws, unwanted meetings, and the prevention of uh, certain judges being elected to magistrates were held up based on the lightning in the southern skies. But, We've progressed, haven't we? We understand lightning differently today. Um, Lightning is a naturally occurring electrostatic discharge during which two electrically charged regions, either in the atmosphere or on the ground, temporarily equalize themselves. 
Y'all didn't know I knew that, did you? <laughs> I didn't know I knew that either. <laughs> Thunder is a sound from a shock wave which develops as gases in the vicinity of that electrostatic discharge experience a sudden increase in pressure. Boom. Thunder. Wow. But you know, in all of our advancements of understanding, we don't go to where the lightning bolt struck and worship. In all of our advances of understanding of lightning, we still can't harness a lightning bolt. Now, we can channel a lightning bolt. We've got lightning rods atop of many a building and many a ship, and, and we, we channel that lightning into a less destructive path. But we've learned a lot, haven't we, from our primitive understanding. We've learned ways to generate, instead of a lightning bolt, what we need to generate is just an electrostatic charge. And that that can be channeled through a series of wires right into the appliances that's running, uh, right, right to the appliances in our kitchens. I am so glad we figured that out, right? But here's my point. Jesus has declared the Father to us. It says in verse number 18, as we conclude that paragraph, Jesus has ex explained the Father to us. He has declared exegesis. That's the word. I'm today trying to exegete a passage of Scripture. And Jesus has explained the Father to us. I want to tell you, God the Father will hold nothing against you if you look at the life of Jesus and you develop your understanding of him through Jesus Christ. You will not be missing anything. The Jesus series. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. Do you fully believe Jesus is the glory of the Father revealed? I'll tell you, you cannot but follow him if you believe that. He's coming to his own. Are we ready to receive him as he is revealed? Well, you know, um, he will lead us every time to a relationship with the Almighty, with the Father. Verse 18 says... That Jesus declares the Father to us. Now, we need to move on. Not only is Jesus the uh, revelation and the glory of the Father, but I have another thing mentioned here. Look at verse 29 in our text this morning. Verse 29. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Would you go down to verse 35? Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard John speak, and they followed Jesus. These men recognized him for who he was. And they responded appropriately by following. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Let me tell you a little something I've been reminded of about the history of Israel regarding a lamb. When Moses erected the tabernacle in the wilderness by God's instruction, and later when Solomon erected the temple in Jerusalem, in either place, daily, once at morning and once at evening, daily, a lamb was sacrificed for Israel. This was a ritual that a priest would bring a lamb at the morning hour because Israel and the people are known, no, no nation, no people are without sin. And through the night, we acknowledge, I have sinned, I confess before God, I'm a sinner. And they did that every morning. And then for the sins of the day, they confessed again, we are sinners. And they made another sacrifice of a lamb. And this was a priest doing this daily. 
And then, as we trace the history of Israel, we learn that once a year, on the Day of Atonement, it wasn't a priest, but it was the high priest. Businesses across the nation would shut down. Everything would come to a halt because the Day of Atonement, the high priest, ceremonially brought a goat to the temple. And there that goat was sacrificed on the Day of Atonement. And I believe it was also at that same time a second goat was sent out from the camp of Israel and went out into the wilderness symbolically understanding the need is for our sins to be gone. But they did these rituals day after day and year after year because the coming Messiah would be the one to do the final ceremony. And then I would remind you that in Israel's daily and uh, life, one time a year, not a high priest and not a priest, but one time a year, every family unit, whoever you were quarantining with, whoever you were housing with, you know, the people that you don't have to wear your mask around, right? <laughs> Every household would secure its own spotless lamb. And it was called Passover. And every household would sacrifice that lamb and put the blood on the doorpost. Because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And for millennia, the people of Israel would once a year, every household would sacrifice their own lamb. And they would do that year after year. But here's my point. Here's my point. Whether it was a priest or whether it was the high priest or whether it was every family household, they were bringing their own lamb. The people provided a sacrifice and therefore it had to be repleted. Can you get with me the blessing, the glory revealed to us in Scripture? Thousands of years of prophecies in the Old Testament come to culmination in verse number 29. Behold, look at it, look at it. See Jesus for who he is. Behold, he's the lamb of God. God gave the lamb. It harkens back to when the nation of Israel was born from the loins of Abraham. On Mount Moriah, he raised a knife to sacrifice and God stopped him in midair and said, there's a ram. I have provided for you a sacrifice. God, John the Baptist said, the lamb of God has been provided. What emphasis do we see Jesus for who he is revealed throughout thousands of years of prophecy precisely to be the God man that took humanity's guilt upon himself. You'll never save yourself. You'll never earn your grace from God, but you can be a sinner saved today by his mercy and grace. You just need to call out to him well notice God provided the lamb so I want to wrap this point up with this in the Old Testament there is a question all throughout and I told you about the ceremonies that went on for thousands of years and the question in the Old Testament is where is the lamb where's the lamb and the answer comes in the New Testament behold the lamb of God here we go. That takes away the sin of the world. Once and for all, the final sacrifice. Oh, I'm so glad that Jesus isn't perpetually on the cross. He's perpetually being sacrificed. No, he is risen. He is seated securely at the hand of the Father. He is waiting for you today, my friend, to put your simple faith and trust in him and to come home, come home to your maker and follow him all the days of your life. I want to tell you, he takes away. 
He did what no goat was capable of doing. I'll tell you, he didn't carry it out into the wilderness just outside of Jerusalem. The Bible says that he takes your sins as far as the east is from the west, and they are remembered no more. Jesus is your Lord. Have you recognized him as that? Have you recognized him as the Lamb of God that must take away your sin? Oh, call out to him and say, take my sin. Take control of my life. I want to be born into your family. Well, you see, friends, um, in the Old Testament, the question is, where is the lamb in the New Testament? The answer comes, behold the lamb. And today for the church and in all eternity, we're going to have a new mantra that we're marching to. And that mantra is, worthy is the lamb. Listen to this prophecy that you and I are going to be called up in an actual time. There is a day coming when the church is removed from planet earth. And I think we're getting close. And before the scrolls of the tribulation are broken open, before the seals begin to be popped open, there's a scene in heaven as to who is worthy to, un, to open the scrolls of judgment that unleash. Listen, friends, we got COVID-19 here, but uh, things that are coming are far worse in the tribulation. Who is worthy? To open those scrolls. Now when he had taken the scroll, the lamb took the scroll. The four living creatures and 24 elders fell down and worshipped the lamb. Each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense which are the prayers of the saints. And they began to sing a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain. You have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. And living creatures and the elders. And the number of angels was 10,000 times 10,000. And thousands of thousands sang with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Well, you see, friends, there's a lot of scripture that goes in. Uh, we've been talking about prophecies of thousands of years old in the Old Testament. Where's the Lamb? Right in the middle of the Bible, right there at the book of the, the beginning of the New Testament. Behold the Lamb. And in the last chapters of the Bible, worthy is the Lamb. This is Jesus Christ revealed to us as the central figure of history whom humanity must look at to know who God is, what God desires, who man is. And that we have a sin transaction that can be taken away. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? He's worthy. He is the Lamb of God. Do you see him as he really is today? And then my third and final point this morning well, begins in verse number 34. John chapter 1 verse 34. John the Baptist was witnessing about Jesus, and here's what he said. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Then verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon. And he said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at Simon, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and he said to Philip, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael 
and said to Nathanael, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and, the pro and also the prophets wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to Nathanael, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to Jesus, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to Nathanael, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to Nathanael, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And Jesus said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Well, a lot of reading there, but Jesus is revealed in John 1 to be the Son of God. This is a messianic title, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the King of Israel, the Christ. All of these are messianic references. Let me begin, first of all, with John the Baptist's description of Jesus being a unique one. A unique one. Verse 14 and verse 18, John the Baptist said that he is the only begotten son. Now, friends, I'm encouraging you today, if you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior, and asked him to forgive your sins and to lead your life. That, my friend, when you come to that position of faith, your faith in what God has said, he has done all the work, that brings you into the family of God. And you are called a child of God. But Jesus is in a different category as a son, the son of God. He has not been born into the family of God. He always has been God. And so for humans to understand and appreciate and get a complete view of God, he became flesh. And in that sense, at that point, the only begotten, the uniquely begotten son is Jesus Christ. He's uniquely the God-man, not to be mixed up with anyone else. So we see here he's the unique one. And you know, think about this. If you read this whole narrative, you have disciples coming into encounter with Jesus in an encounter with Jesus and they walked with him they went to where he was abiding and the near as I can tell from the references they spent Andrew and John the writer of this book spent eight hours in the presence of Jesus and they came away with an entirely new life direction have you seen Jesus for who he is, for who he is revealed in Scripture. Completely unique one that changed these men's direction in a mere eight hours. Now, I also see Jesus as the Son of God who gives unique insight. Unique insight. In verse number 42, Simon is Andrew's brother. And Simon... Jesus renames him. You will be called Cephas. And that's an Aramaic word translated in Greek as Peter. And both translations simply mean a stone. What's happening here? I want you to know that Jesus has revealed himself to be the one with unique insight into you. He knows the character and destiny of your life. We need to heed and listen. No one can see your future more clearly than the Son of God. 
He knew Peter would be a rock. Not the foundation of the church, but a rock in the church. And he saw that. And then in verse number 47, no one can give you unique insight about where you're heading and the full potential of your life like Jesus Christ. He, he saw Nathaniel, or Nathaniel, when he first heard about Jesus and Philip's opinion, uh, Nathaniel was not impressed. He said, uh, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was home to a Roman garrison. And when that Roman garrison of soldiers lived there, many people in Nazareth would have carried on commerce and would have had many kinds of complicated relationships with those uh, salty soldiers. And those coming out of Nazareth were perceived to be compromised. Nathaniel said, can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip, not arguing, he just said, look, just come and see. I spent hours and I'm changed. Come and see. Oh, you know what's happening here? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. If we would come and see Jesus, I, I'm not so sure. Are we ready to receive what we see? Who he reveals himself to be. Well, you know, Nathaniel is talking and Jesus Jesus answers Nathanael, or he, he defines Nathanael in verse 47. An Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. How did Jesus know this? Jesus understood that Nathanael often under, sat and mused and understood that truthfulness and trustworthiness is the character of the almighty creator and somehow I need to be pure and trustworthy and not have guile and deceit found in me. And Nathaniel worked on this and it was very important fragmented view of the father. And Jesus picked up on that right away and he said, you are a man in whom is no deceit. Nathaniel goes, how did you know that about me? How did you know that was my passion, to be honest and truthful? Before Philip called you, you were sitting under the fig tree. I saw you. Listen, friend, Jesus came to his own, and his own did not receive him. And here's something I want to say to all of God's own. He sees you. When you're under the fig tree, when you're out on the desert journey path, he sees you. And no one can speak blessing and no one can carry you forward. No one can know the future like Jesus Christ. He sees you and he can take you from this point to this point. But you have to turn the control over to him. I see you. Follow me, Nathaniel. Old Nathaniel did not find it strange to know that the omnipotent one had such knowledge of him because all through the Old Testament we are told of this. In Psalms 139, Jesus being God in the flesh is, 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 is replicating exactly the Father's understanding of all people where it says these words in Psalms 139, you know my down sitting, my uprising. Father, you understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and aren't acquainted with all my ways. Wouldn't it be nice to have someone leading your life that knows all the paths that you are about to come upon? There's not even a word on my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, you know it all together. Your eyes, Father, have seen my substance when I was yet in the womb, unformed. In your book, all the days of my life were written when not even yet one of those days have been lived out. How precious, Father, are your thoughts to me, O God, how great is the sum of them. When we have the unique Son of God uniquely guiding our life, 
I want to tell you, friend, there's no more secure place on the planet to be than that. Wow. He came into his own, but his own didn't receive him. Jesus saw the sincerity of Nathanael. He saw the sincerity of Nathanael. And he challenged Nathanael to believe God for greater things. He said, Nathanael, you are ready to follow me just over me saying, I know this about your disposition in your heart. He said, you're going to see greater things. Follow me. Let's reread those verses, please. Um, In John 1, verse 51. And Jesus said to him, Most assuredly I say to you hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So here we see Jesus, the Son of God. He is the unique only begotten. He gives unique insight into your life. Follow him. But he gives a unique vision. We need to follow that vision. You know, Jesus was saying unequivocally, to Nathaniel, he said, through my life, you are going to see heaven open and you're going to see the activity of God, the agents of God coming and going. And through my life, you're going to see God work. Follow me, Nathaniel. You're going to see greater things than this little intellect if you will follow me. You know, Dr. David Jeremiah says something very interesting. He comments that the temple at that time was located at the very spot where Jacob had a dream of angels going up and down on a ladder from heaven. You remember the dream? And the angels of God ascending and descending. And that the temple was built on that very spot where Jacob had the dream. You know what Nathaniel was musing upon, I think, while he was under the fig tree? He was musing upon there's got to be more. Here we are in servitude to Rome. Here we are a subjugated people. Oh, the things in our nation are bad. Even the religious practice is pathetically abhorrent. God's not honoring all this. It's full of guile. It's full of deceit. And he says there's got to be something greater from the Almighty than this. And he's meditating on these things. And then Jesus reveals his meditation back to him. And he said, do you know what? I am the new ladder. I am the new temple. Follow me and you're going to see God's working in and through your life. Well, I want to conclude. Bon, don't we need to see a greater work from God today? Isn't that the need of the hour? Jesus is the glory of the Father, fully revealed. He's the Lamb of God. He's the Son of God. But what is our response to him? He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. People did not receive Jesus' work in their life. But will you? Will I? Let's stand with our heads bowed, please. This is a time of prayer. And as the music begins to play, I would just ask all Christians to be in prayer. We have Pastor Curry at the front of the church. If anyone needs to respond and pray with someone, let me plead with you. Have you received Jesus as the Lamb of God, the Savior from your sins and the leader and master of your life? Have you received him? Pastor Curry's here at the front if he can pray with you about that. Church family, think about this. The glory of the Father being revealed. That is exciting. That's the energy we need every day to get through this grind. May we see Jesus revealed more clearly. The Lamb of God will save us. The glory of the Father will excite us. And the Son of God is ready to uniquely interact with the details of your life. Our Father, as 
believers are praying, so must I. We agree that worthy is the Lamb. We confess with John the Baptist that we are not worthy to unloose the strap of the sandal of Jesus. But instead, you've graced us with grace piled upon grace. And we stand before you this morning. Having come through the cross of Christ, we stand in grace. And you just pile on the blessings. Continue your work in our life. Bless your people as they pray. As we wait before the Lord this morning, we remind you that if you have children that you need to pick up, you'll be dismissed at the end of the prayer and the rest of the congregation to remain and the ushers to release you row by row. So let us pray together. Oh, Father, thank you for this message. How it touches our heart, how it may, reminds us of our Savior as he came into this world. Oh, what a glorious revelation of yourself. How that men blinded by sin and unbelief were not able to see your glory. But oh, thank you, Father. Thank you that the scripture says as many as did receive him, to them he gives the right to be called the children of God. And so, Father, we can call you Father, Abba, Daddy, our dear Father. Touch our hearts with the word today. Transform our mind, our thoughts, and our desires. May we go from your house today with rejoicing, with gladness to know that the world has a Savior. His name is Jesus. And we have the message, we have the story to tell. And help us to go with that thought in mind. Dismiss us in your loving care, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Have a wonderful day. God bless you all.